Well, more the state of universities in the state of Australia, but I join colleagues in what has quickly become an Australian tradition, and that is acknowledging country here on unceded Kulin lands and a warm welcome to elders and Aboriginal people who join us today. And I'd like to acknowledge too a colleague who, though not Indigenous, grew up in an Aboriginal community and has retained through his life a strong personal connection to the adopted sisters and brothers he knew as a child in North Queensland. And that's the Chief Texa Commissioner, Professor Peter Coldrake, who we just heard from. Peter's own story is a testament to family and to education, an academic journey that took Peter through outback schools, first to James Cook University in Townsville, and then to Griffith University in Brisbane, where our paths first crossed. And we've been friends and colleagues, often working together over the many decades since then. Peter's known, of course, for his integrity and his deep knowledge of higher education, and he's demonstrated that commitment in so many roles within the sector, including as the chair of Universities Australia, but also as a public servant, an independent reviewer, a board chair, an arts patron, and a talented piano player. And we're very fortunate that a key sector regulatory agency such as TEXA can call on such skills and values. Now, during Peter's professional lifetime, Australia's public universities have undergone a transformation with no precedent in our history. They have grown, in short, from being small and intimate to being large and complex. When Peter thought of going to university in his final year of school, less than 3% of Australians held tertiary qualifications. And today, as we've just heard, nearly half our Year 12 graduates aspire to a place on campus. The James Cook University in Townsville that Peter joined was a very modest size institution. It had only relatively recently become an independent university. It offered just a small number of degrees from a single campus. Nearly half a century later, there are eight JCU campuses or sites right across far north Queensland, but into Brisbane and Singapore and beyond, and all sharing a global reputation for tropical research, tropical zone research. And, and I think in many ways, Peter's alma mater is the classic Australian public university across multiple campuses, a deep commitment to research, a focus on local community, thoughtful links with First Nations people from the region, and a well-established program for student equity. And JCU resembles other Australian public universities too in offering courses across a huge array of disciplines and everything from bachelor degrees uh, and micro-credentials through to PhD. At JCU, we can see the familiar administrative structures and student services organised by schools and faculties and academic boards and governing councils and vice-chancellors. Here in one place is the Australian idea of a public university, a model that's largely replicated across the nation. JCU has 21,000 students and 4,000 staff, and that makes it very comparable in size, if not slightly larger, than most British, Canadian and American public universities. But this is the one unusual feature of JCU, because at 21,000 students, it's small by Australian standards where the universities, on average, teach more than any of their overseas counterparts. In fact, Australia now hosts some of the largest public universities in the world, in the OECD world. Two of our institutions here in Melbourne are about to hit 100,000 enrolled students, which is extraordinary by global standards. It wasn't always so. In earlier times, when a university became too big, governments established new institutions to take up the growth. There was a time when, as the University of Melbourne hit 7,000 students, there was a panic in Spring Street and an agreement to set up a new university because 7,000 was obviously way too many. Australian higher education, therefore, has been characterised over the last 100 years by waves of institutional foundations, new universities created. In the 1930s, we had a go at setting up a rural residential university in New with New England. In the 1960s and the 1970s, we set up multidisciplinary institutions without traditional professional programs in Macquarie and La Trobe and later Griffith, Murdoch and others. 
And then in 1989, we decided to merge all of our smaller uh, institutions into a number of universities in what was called, and still is called, the Unified National System. And we imposed significant standardisation and, a, and we regulated a very specific Australian approach to higher education. For example, the Unified National System made research a necessary feature for university accreditation, whether public or private. And that policy remains, even though it's very hard to cover the full costs of research through income. Hence, unfortunately, the imperative to grow, to recruit many students, international students in particular, and to grow, and to grow, and to grow. Peter will remember well the very young university, Griffith University, where he and I first worked. Um, it was a tiny community. We had just under 3,000 students in a forest campus uh, just south of Brisbane. I look at Griffith now, only a generation on, and it has 55,000 students. It teaches across five campuses. It's 78 kilometres from the most northern campus to the most southern. I'd say that with feeling having driven it many, many times. When Peter left Griffith in 1990, he joined and led the Public Sector Management Commission in Queensland, and later he joined QUT, first as Deputy Vice-Chancellor and then as a very long-serving Vice-Chancellor. And there he was party to very similar expansion, and QUT today has 53,000 students across its networks. And we can tell a very similar story about most of Australia's public universities. The recent decades have seen an absolute transformation in their scale. Let me give you a practical example, the University of Sydney. Over the last 30 years, the University of Sydney has grown its student numbers by 132%, its academic staff by 89%, its professional staff by 55%. But perhaps the most remarkable statistic is the increase in international students. It is 1,677%. And today, the University of Sydney enrols 73 thousand students, which makes it larger than any, any university in Britain or Canada and amongst the largest universities in America. There are, I think, important and relatively simple reasons for this extraordinary go growth, and I'm just going to pick out four that I think are significant. First is the unrelenting pressure for new places on campus, which was driven through the 80s and 90s by rapid increase in year 12 graduations, particularly amongst young women who sought, as they rightly should, their place on campus. That effect alone was transformational. Um, going to university became a mainstream ambition and we can see that a majority of university students are now female, which shows you just how profound that change has been over a single generation. Secondly, while student numbers kept growing, government funding per student kept falling. It has not kept pace with the cost of education, which led to pressure three, the need to recruit international students to keep the university solvent. Indeed, at the start of COVID, one, nearly one in every four students on an Australian campus was an international student. And interesting, I was talking to the Chancellor of La Trobe University last night who mentioned that La Trobe's uh, indicative figures for 2023 say that it will finally return to pre COVID numbers, so that tells you the change that's underway. Why international students? Because only their fees allowed the domestic system to operate, given inadequate Commonwealth support. Since many domestic fees the fee, um, just don't cover the cost of delivering the course, universities rely utterly on international students to fund capital expansion, to fund staff hires, to keep the doors open. But let me suggest those are familiar changes. Let me suggest a fourth reason for the huge growth on our universities, and that is simple, the absence of new players. Once government met demand by creating new universities, this trend ended in 1992. We've seen virtually no new public universities after that spectacular round of voluntary and sometimes hostile mergers that created took all of the colleges of advanced education and institutes and distinctive learning institutions and pushed them into universities. Only a handful of public universities have, been emer have emerged since then, 
along with those private university colleges and institutes that Peter mentioned in his speaking, and they are all really important additions to the sector, but they account in total for less than 10% of the student load. More than 90% of Australian students are studying at a public university. Now, the expansion has advantages. It's allowed Australia to develop one of the most successful education export markets in the world. And anyone in the room who's travelled and spoken to colleagues overseas, they understand something that Australians don't, just how astonishingly successful this sector has been at attracting international students. Um, and this is particularly marked, and again not often commented on, in graduate education. It is in fact remarkable that a majority of international students in our country are graduate students, not undergraduates. And that's a transformation that's happened within the sector only in the last 10 years but it's a very profound change. We have become a very attractive destination for people to get their second degree or their professional qualification, which is really promising for the future. But growth and success come with significant implications because size imposes complexity. It makes Australian universities more alike as they get larger. In the United States, there are hundreds of small specialist institutions, mostly in health, technology, music and the arts, law and theology. Um, this is a really standard part of their system. Perhaps the most famous, of course, is the California Institute of Technology, which specialises in engineering, science, maths and astronomy, uh, and this year enrolled 2,397 students, um, which means they would go broke if they were Australian. In the United States, there are, in the uh, sorry, United Kingdom, there are still many small institutions for those staff and those students who value a more intimate campus and a chance to be part of something that's more intimate. And likewise, the Canadian system is marked by choice, including universities which principally teach undergraduates, do not offer doctoral level programs. Of, of course, none of those would be accredited under Australian law. The attraction is really obvious, I think. Small residential colleges, the feeling of being part of a community in which you're likely to know every face, comfortable class sizes, teaching often provided by professors, uh, professionals who are not faced or, excuse me, also with the constant pressure to publish. But small classes and an intimate campus are very hard to reconcile with the Australian funding model for higher education. So we have scale, that's how we've got around that. We've introduced scale. We've, we've given a lot of other names. We talk about neoliberalism and all sorts of stuff, but you can actually explain many of the changes that have happened just by pointing to the sheer scale now of our universities. Um, scale undermines, in my view, the sense of belonging. It affects staff-student ratios and surveys. It triggers complaints about reporting overloads. It creates distance between staff and management. Scale requires standardised administration, sophisticated student systems and constant building programs to provide the space and the services and the security commensurate with a large, with sort of a medium sized city. And I often remarked at the University of Melbourne that we were the fifth largest city in Victoria on any working day and you can tell that same story about and in many uh, of our original campuses they are larger than the city they, they um, started with. And like cities, universities begin to look and behave much the same because they all have to tackle the same problems. They have to balance the same contending demands. And so the university becomes the major property holder, the large employer, the important contributor to the local economy, the big organisation that's trying to mix traditional academic virtues and values with the stark realities of market vulnerability, close regulation and endless competition. And I say all this not in despair, but just as an invitation to acknowledge our reality and continue to innovate. Because when you look between now and 2030, there are 100,000 more domestic undergraduates due to join the system. And the question becomes, do we accommodate all of these new students in our existing organisations, or do we try and begin to think about alternatives? I want to suggest to you that the recently announced Higher Education Accord Review, the first in 15 years, offers a chance to mull some important and long-neglected questions about the sort of system we want to have. 
we can ask, we should ask, whether the familiar Australian public university is our only choice. And that's not to criticise current providers or to suggest that they need to change, but rather a review and the prospect of very significant student growth ahead asks, are there other options we should also be exploring? Are there other models we should bring into play? It seems to me this could be a time for new institutions that are consciously different from the mainstream. Institutions which preference teaching over research, which use pedagogical innovation to widen participation, which offer bold experiments with graduate pathways, with novel aggregations of disciplines, institutions which teach in multiple languages, which specialise in neglected disciplines or focus all of their energy on just a handful of vital fields. Perhaps more institutions with indigenous knowledge at their core. The wide-ranging Accord Review to be chaired by Professor Mary O'Kane is a chance to question assumptions about the Australian University, to broaden the conversation, to build on our success, but also to see what we could do differently. Our sector is a great national achievement. It's a key to continued prosperity, but every system, however successful, can be better, stronger, more relevant. We can visualise a system with more varied institutions, some large and others small, some comprehensive and others specialist, commuter or residential, with more scope for experimentation and rapid evolution. A system that embraces interdisciplinary knowledge with innovative courses that complement rather than repeat the offerings of the existing universities. And we can think too, as Peter has just invited us to do, about new approaches to regulation, about the lessons absorbed by Texas through its history. How can we make the shape of the sector more relevant, more agile, while preserving the quality at the core of the Texas mission? And so a conference like this is a chance to acknowledge what has been achieved, what works, and to think about what can be even better. What might a system truly fit for the future look like? Because here is our chance, one of those rare moments, to dream, to argue, to put forward ideas. So thank you, Peter, for the invitation to speak and to be part of this conversation. Mike's important. Uh, whoa, that was awesome. That woke you up. So uh, we have the opportunity for some questions from, from the audience or also online if you want to put ask a question in the box. We'll get an iPad up here for some questions, probably one or two. If there's any questions for Professor Davis. Come on, there has to be one. Oh, over here, waving. Thanks, our mics. <laughs> Uh, Phil Honeywood, uh, hi, Clint. Um, t and &E, transnational education, that hasn't been mentioned. Uh, the Brits have been incredibly good at that, largely because Theresa May didn't want international students coming to the UK, so they had to go, go forth and multiply. Um, where do you see transnational education, offshore campus delivery, partner campuses fitting in, particularly given that University of Melbourne, of course, wasn't very big on t and &E, but others had been? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. It's a great question. Thank you for the work you do in encouraging this. It's really important and has been now very long-lasting and, and very influential. Transnational education is sort of, if you'd said 25 years ago we're going to have uh, a majority of Australian universities are going to have offshore presence and they're going to have campuses outside or at least courses taught outside Australia and they're going to build a big market. Um, that would have seemed fanciful and yet it's now the case. And if you'd said we were going to have a global pandemic and those universities that have offshore campuses will be much better placed to hedge against local losses and to be able to continue education offshore because they have campuses alongside their, um, what they'll do online, again, that might have seemed fanciful, and yet both of those have come to pass. You have to assume that that model will continue and will grow and that as we engage more with our region, we'll see more Australian universities and other forms of higher education providers choose to go offshore. Not every, it won't work for everyone. It's not a good idea for everyone. But one of the interesting questions is at what point will we stop putting general campuses offshore and start to go to specialist skills where we have comparative advantage, where an institution is fabulous at engineering and it decides to open an engineering campus. Uh, in Thailand rather than as we tend to do the general campuses. So I think 
you know, we're onto a trend here that isn't about to change and we'll just accelerate. Thank I you. Just someone over there with a One more. And as the leader of an offshore international campus, I yeah. think that's a very interesting observation. Uh, well, one more question. Was there one here? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hey, um, I just wanted to ask, um, so the terms of references for the University Accords have been released. How do you um, envision student voice being incorporated into that? Um, that's a great question. I'm probably the wrong person to answer it um, because I'm not, I'm not part of that process. I've had a couple of conversations with Professor O'Kane about what she's planning to do. Her aspiration is to, is to consult very widely and to get as many different voices in case we've got Jenny Macklin here, who's wonderful to see her as part of the review panel, um, and she'll know more than I about how they're planning. But uh, all I can say is I'm confident that this is front of mind and very of huge interest to them, as it is to Texer. It was great to see in Peter's slide um, the interest in how does Texer engage directly with student voice as well. I expect to see very much an active response on that, but as I say, I'm probably the wrong person to, to reply. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Davis, for coming today for the keynote. Thank you. Thank you.